In the last video, we saw the unfortunate end of the engine in my Mazda Miata and we went and got a new one, except that I haven't actually filmed that video yet. I'm filming this one first because it's more convenient for me that way. YouTubers are lying to you. Also, the BMW is broken now. Yes, to the surprise and shock of absolutely nobody, my infallible daily driver is yet again having issues. And this is a problem because this car and that car are pretty much my only two viable daily drivers. My hot swappable spare in my raid array of cars has let me down, so now it's pretty important that I get this working again. Why can't I daily drive the others? Well, this one gets like five miles per gallon and has no working gauges. Uh, this one is just very broken. This one is also very broken, and the Maxima is in pieces to hopefully get it ready for cars and coffee this weekend. It's what I should be doing right now, but instead I'm working on this. My last hope, just like Obi-Wan um, Mandalorian. Anyway, the problem that I've been having stay has been wonky cold starts, mediocre fuel economy, poor idle, and lean codes. Most of you already know what this is going to be. And honestly, I should have done this a long time ago. Under here, we have an M54B30 engine. Wow, you've seen this all before. And here is a very common issue with them. The rubber intake boots crack and create a vacuum leak. This isn't even a BMW issue. This is just all cars, all recent cars. They all have vacuum leaks, it just happens. How on earth did this get so dusty? So today, we're going to replace the upper and lower intake boots. We're going to inspect the DESA in the process because it has to come out because we're also going to remove and clean the idle air control valve, um, which again, needs done on most cars. I mean, the day that the Mazda blew up, I was cleaning the throttle body because it doesn't have an idle air control valve. It just uses the throttle body and it got gunked up. Let's get some tools together and um, start fixing. Now this is one of those jobs that is uh, not only high in calcium and nutrients, but also high in while you're in there things, because there's a lot you can see with the intake boots off and a lot you can get at. So you might as well just get at all of it and get some other stuff done to keep your German pain in the Stufwaffle. I don't even know if that's a real word. It's probably something from World War II that's pretty politically incorrect, but no, stoof waffles of food. I don't know. You try to make a joke, but yeah, a lot of stuff that could be a pain later on down the line that you might as well just take care of now, including, but not limited to, the clips on this stinking air box. Cold air intake doesn't do anything on these cars. Like, it, you're not really getting anything out of spending the money, but it sounds cool, and it means you don't have to deal with this stupid air box anytime you need to work on your car. There we go. There we are. Everyone always wants you to remove the uh, snorkel over there. I don't understand why you would remove the snorkel. You can just pull the air box out of it. How did I already tear my glove? Mass airflow sensor looks good, which is good because the uh, 330i, <laughs> there's a hair in it. The 330i uses a uh, Special mass airflow sensor, they're very expensive. Don't wanna to have to replace that. Pull what's called the F connector out. The F connector is putting up a fight. Fortunately, I don't care if I damage the boot since I'm already replacing the boot. So I'm just gonna go at it with a flathead screwdriver. Oh, you can't see it, oops. Not even from really like tearing at it. This just split apart with next to no effort. This rubber is done. It did not seem this bad a year ago. So now we've got more of those ding dang Jubilee clips, I believe they're called. And I need a longer screwdriver. Come on. The answer is sockets, apparently. The amount of tools that I own, but do not know the locations of, is simply staggering at this point. I refuse to admit that it's my problem. Obviously, the problem lies, oh, nope, don't step whatever. Retrieve your bayonet, your Jubilee clip. 
from the top of your alternator. Pardon me, let me get this strut tower brace out of the way so we can see what's going on. Maybe. There we go. Uh, take this electrical connector off of the DISA. Just squeeze that part and off it comes. Very easy. Cabin air filter off. And then out comes the cover. And out comes the filter. Is in need of replacement. And the bolts are just totally missing. Very cool. Oh. Oh, okay, you can just take that out of the brake booster. All right. There we go. This brake booster line seems to be in great shape. I have a little check valve at the end of it. Okay, what is next? Looks like the DISA is probably the next thing to take off, and that has a bolt here and a bolt here. Uh, if you're going to check or replace your DISA, this is probably the point that you'd want to get to. I have done it with that plastic shield still in place. It sucked. <laughs> Wiggles right out. And I have replaced this O-ring. Things to check for. Make sure this is, is not loose or rattling. And now I'm not getting a very good seal with my gloves, but that's how you check if it, if it, leaks down over time when you put your thumb over that diaphragm, then it's bad. This one is good. At this point, I'd just like to plug that up. You know, I suppose it'd help if the camera was actually pointing at what I was talking to about. Uh, this is the lower boot. This baffle here, usually see failures there. And then of course, Jubilee clips are totally facing the wrong direction. I found a deep six. Hey! Naturally, the second I turn off the camera, there we go, I use some penetrating oil. It worked a treat. What's, what's missing to get this guy out of here? I think it just pulls out. Yes, it does just pull out. So that's the idle air control valve. I believe it's supposed to be able to freely move and it does. Yeah, there we go. That's actually fine, which is strange because one of the problems my car was having was very much a symptom of this not working right. Well, I got the inside of this cleaned out a bit. There we go. Plug back in. Cool. Now we're to the part where I need to go buy parts. So I guess we'll go do that. To O'Reilly's. Mmm, despite both being by the same company, the upper one came with new clamps, the lower one did not. Or the lower one came with new clamps, the upper one did not. I'll get that right one of these days. Something else to do, if you haven't done it, is back here, there are some uh, vacuum caps. Uh, as you can see, that one is red vinyl. They come with rubber ones from the factory and they are always disintegrated to absolute nothing. So that's a very likely vacuum leak. I already fixed it on this car. There is one, two, three, uh, one large and two small. You still can't really see them here, but they're back there. And yeah, I did confirm that line down there, uh, very hard to see at the base of the uh, dipstick tube. That is the drain line for the CCV system and it is from a cold weather package car. So that's kind of a neat upgrade. What that does is it keeps stuff from freezing in there and clogging it up, which can cause CCV failure prematurely. So this looks like it's had a refreshed CCV fairly recently. And judging by the fact that this thing wasn't all gummed up, the idle air control valve, it seems like someone did actually take decent care of this engine, uh, just not the rest of the car. Hmm. All the footage of me getting to this point is just the back of my dumb head, but I got the new lower boot on. I got rid of the Jubilee clips that came with it, and I reused the old ones just because they're all 8mm. I think this is 8mm. 6mm. Whatever. They're all 6mm, and then just a little bit nicer. I also pulled this coupler out of the old one. 
that goes in here like so. The intake is in place and all buttoned up, including the mass airflow sensor attached. I have not yet put in the F connector because we still have to put all this stuff back. But uh, the clocking here of this boot kind of threw me off. You have to twist it clockwise more than I thought so that this is more or less coming out of here at a straight angle. You, you can kind of see how scrunched up this part is. Um, so it's not really where it wants to sit naturally, but that's where uh, it makes everything else line up. And I had to go and look at how the old one not that one, this one, you can see how it's kind of squished uh, right on that part as well. So, yep, that's the way the old one is. So that's the way the new one shall be. At this point, put DISA back. And actually, once I put the DISA back and hook the F connector back up, uh, the car should be able to start, well, and plug some stuff back in. Um, the F connector, by the way, these aren't vacuum lines. These are atmospheric references for the fuel pressure regulator and uh, whatever the heck that thing is. Looks like some sort of brake booster check valve. Uh, they just want filtered atmospheric reference. It would have been better if this filtered reference was before the math so that if any of this is leaking, it's not a big deal because really it's not super critical that those things have filtered air. It's just kind of German over-engineering, but nope, it's behind the math. So uh, this little one here, that goes down to the fuel filter and regulator assembly, which is under the driver's seat area of the floor. And uh, those go bad all the time. So that's another common source of vacuum leaks. Uh, when I pulled on this a few months ago, it just came right out of the car because it had disintegrated down on the side that's on the ground. So yeah. <laughs> so I'm gonna throw the DISA back in and I'm gonna wrangle that big plastic thing back into place and check back in. Well, there it is all done. And my gosh, the wind is picking up. No parts left over, nothing unhooked that I'm aware of. So uh, let's go drive it, I guess. The only thing I forgot to do was get a new cabin air filter. I did remember to hook the brake booster line back up. That's important. So now it's time for the real test to see if this idles better and see if my fuel trims are any better. I haven't smoke tested this. I can't really smoke test it with how windy it is today, but here's hoping. How's she start? Pretty smooth. So one thing I was noticing was I was getting a lean code every now and then, uh, and also my fuel, and the lean code trips when the uh, cumulative fuel trims are above, I believe 15%. I've got torque pulled up on my ENN head unit, and I'm going to scroll down to my fuel trims. Definitely healthier. And there's going to be adaptations that I haven't cleared yet, so we'll kind of see what it does as we drive it. This definitely doesn't feel as crappy as it did, though. I think we're back to uh, normal, which I was hoping for an improvement over normal, but I'll take not broken. For whatever reason, my bank two fuel trims, much higher than my bank one fuel trims, uh, which is odd because bank two is the one that has a new O2 sensor. So... That seems like it could mean that bank one is reading a richer mixture than I actually have, or potentially I have an exhaust leak that I'm not hearing. But also, I'm getting some pretty negative short-term trims, so we'll just have to see how this evens out over time. I still definitely prefer the nice, stiff, supportive seats of a BMW over the soft, plushy couches in my Buick might just be something to do with my bad back, but uh, this style of comfort definitely is preferable to me. I've also driven, you know, Roadmaster, Caprice, you know, the old, uh, old big B bodies and that sort of stuff. And it's just not a type of comfort that appeals to me that much anymore. This is kind of where it's at. Comfy, but purposeful, supportive, intentioned. The non-sport seats are absolute trash though. Don't base E46 comfort off of the non-sport seats. Those things are wooden park benches. Ah, the lumps in my power delivery are gone. 
at 2,500, about 3,200, 4,000, and like for every 200 RPM past that, I would get this sort of lurching power delivery. And I'm guessing that that would be the computer trying to compensate for the bad readings it was getting from the mass airflow sensor. Yeah, we're down to 3.1% long-term fuel trim on bank one and an 8.6% trim on bank two. It's not where I'd love to be, but it's okay. It'll get me around town. That's how I've been driving it pretty much the whole time I've owned this car since I fixed my uh, lean condition issues. So yeah, sure, fine. It's smooth this way at least and reliable. It's just not optimal. Ah, good, my rev matching is easier again. I have no idea what the readings are because my OVD2 reader has decided not to connect to the car anymore for some reason. Hopefully this is the last I see of that check engine light. I do have one other check engine light that I get every now and then. That's for the barometric pressure, pressure sensor. On the MS45 uh, DMEs, the pressure sensor is actually soldered inside the ECU itself. So fixing that means desoldering a surface mount component and getting a new one off DigiKey and soldering a new one on. And my hands are not steady enough for that. So I'll have to probably take the DME to someone, which means the car will be down for a few days and I can't afford that right now because I have to drive it. So stuff like that's just gonna have to wait. The bigger deal, the, the bigger issue that I really wanted to take this thing off the road to fix is I'm pretty sure my subframe mounts are torn I get the occasional noise from back there that sounds a little bit sus. Power delivery is so smooth now though. I love talking about how uh, my subframe mounts are probably screwed and then going wide open throttle in my car. Uh, it wasn't wide open throttle, it was more like half. I'm pretty sure those are hosed, so I will uh, need to weld in the reinforcement plates and fix all of that with the welder that I don't, well, I have a 110 volt um, flux core welder. I'm not sure that's really the tool for the job there. <laughs> but now that I have the quick jacks, getting that subframe out should be a breeze other than the parking brake cables. I hear a bit of a faff. Hopefully this fixes my fuel economy too. My last four or five Phillips have been pretty bad and with uh, things the way they are, I don't really want that. And the idle is smoother, so I think my idle air control valve was a little bit sticky. It's just as soon as I sort of wiggled it, it broke loose. I cleaned it out a bit more, some brake cleaner and whatnot, gave it a little lubricant. Thanks for watching.